Hello, Alan Rue here. Um, it's it, it, it's kind of odd going on YouTube because now Twitter is a free speech area. You can say what you want there, but you move over to this social media and it's a police state, you know, <laughs> S similar to how COVID was um, like people. If you live close to a border, you could just drive over and, and freedoms on the other side. I um my friend HD, he lived in british columbia close to alberta alberta had lost all of its r r restrictions in british columbia they still had him he lived 20 minutes away from freedom he could drive over the border to a, a town on the other side to hang out uh and, and be free however um uh, uh <laughs> his town was under massive restrictions poor soul that's how it is with twitter you, you know um, Twitter and YouTube, freedom on Twitter, police state on YouTube. So I have to watch what I say. I'm wearing my Houston trash throws Jersey, uh, to celebrate the victory of the trash throws winning the world series. Congratulations, trash throws, you disgusting pieces of trash who cheated anyway. Um, uh, and who knows in a few years, it might come out that they cheated at this world series. Okay. Anyway, I am going to do a book review, The Alexiad. Uh, now, l let me tell you what The Alexiad's about. It's medieval history. And the question is, is it church history or secular history? It's secular history, but keep in mind, uh, at that time, uh, church and state were attached at the hip. So, um, now, first I want to say the biggest mistake that people make when they study um, church history, especially the me medieval church. What, what, what do you think when you think of medieval church history? You think of monks, monasteries, scholastic theologians, uh, the investiture controversy, the popes getting mad at kings for appointing bishops, um, um, crusades, things like that. That's what you think of when you think of medieval church history. However, what a lot of people forget is that uh, there is still a Christian state in the East. Like there's a lot of Christians in the Middle East, but they're under Islamic control. They're still part of of Christendom, but they're, well, I guess they're not part of Christendom. They're not under a Christian government, but um, you, you st they're, they're under Islamic control. But in, in Constantinople and Anatolia and part of Greece, you had the Byzantine Empire. Of course, it's not, back in the day, it was not called that. It's just the Roman Empire, which was a Greek Christian state in the east of course in 1054 we saw the schism of the latin roman catholic church and the greek eastern orthodox church um now this book is a post-schism byzantine history book it's called the alexiad by anna comnina now um First of all, what does Alexiad mean? It's a play off the word, the Iliad. Uh, and it's a biography of Alexius Comnenus. He was a Byzantine emperor from 1081 to 1118 and uh, the father of Anna Comnena. So, so Anna Comnenus, but the Alexiad is a biography of her father. It's a long biography too. It's almost 500 pages for a medieval biography of one person that's pretty long. But it's very thorough and, and, and very good. Now, um, so yeah, so people tend to forget the Byzantine Empire, but we're going to show you a biography of a very important person. Now, he is also the Byzantine Emperor who appeals to the Pope for the Crusades. So he's important in that way, and important for me because I love studying the Crusades. But it's just not about the Crusades. That's only a small part of his life that gets talked about in here. Uh, he, it talks about um, the uh, tons of 
wars that the Byzantine Empire got in, uh, wars against the Turks, wars against wars against the Normans under Robert Guiscard, wars against the Scythians or Scythians. I don't know how to pronounce that. Wars against the Cumans, C U M A N S, which I believe were from us uh, from somewhere in Bulgaria. So. Um, yeah, it goes through all his wars and the role he played, him commanding troops, because at the time he took over, uh, being emperor in 1081, he had kind of to oppose the um, the previous guy, threw him in a monastery. And um, he, um, back then, the empire was completely broke. It, it had barely any troops, a huge re reversal of fortune than it was a hundred years prior under Basil the Polgar Slayer. Um, so some interesting things about Alexius. He was uh, himself, as I said, involved in a lot of wars. He was also a theologian. The 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 emperors had a uh, yes yes. Botanietes, I, I, I'm sure I'm pronouncing that horrifically wrong. They threw him in a monastery. And he complained, actually, that he's like, oh, now I can't eat meat anymore, you know. It's like, but a lot of deposed emperors ended up far worse, if you know what I mean. Okay, so uh, he loved to study theology. And uh, she talks about her father and her m mother here and how they used to study theology. Is there any sane person who has not seen the holy couple absorbed day and night deep in the study of holy scripture i am talking of course about my parents i will digress here for a moment the law of rhetoric will not grudge me that privilege many a time when a meal was already served i remember seeing my mother with a book in her hands diligently reading the dogmatic pronouncements of the holy fathers especially of the philosopher and martyr Maximus, that's Maximus the Confessor. Inquiries into the physical nature of things did not interest her so much as a study of dogma, for she longed, and it's talking about his wife here, the, the Empress Irene, for she longed to reap the benefits of true wisdom. It often occurred to me to wonder at this, and as a result, I once asked her, how could you of your own accord aspire to such sublimity. For my part, I tremble and dare not consider such things even in the smallest degree. The man's writing so highly abstract and intellectual makes the reader's head swim. She smiled. Your reluctance is commendable, I'm sure, she replied. And I myself do not approach such books without tremble, yet I cannot tear myself away from them. Wait a little, and after a close look, at other books, believe me, you will not taste the sweetness of these. So both both Alexius and his wife loved to study theology, his wife being the Empress Irene. And there's probably another reason for that is because back in those days, the emperor in the post-schism Greek church for a few centuries, I'm not sure how long, but the emperor essentially played the role of pope. He appointed all bishops, certainly in the empire. He decided the doctrinal um, questions. There are examples of that. He'd head the inquisitions himself. In this book, there's a, a quote where Anaconina refers to him as a high priest and the 13th apostle. That's like... In the post-schism Greek church, you have Caesaropapism off the rail. And there's many examples of it in here. Although there are more powerful examples outside. Uh, I won't get, in get into that today. Um, now, she talks about uh, her, the faith of her father, who was a devout Christian ruler. Um, okay. Uh, she talks about the faith of her father. W one can truly say that the emperor was a most saintly person, both because of his virtues and in his manner of speaking, a high priest. 
as it were, of perfect reverence. He was an excellent teacher of our doctrine with an apostle's faith and message, eager to convert to Christ, not only the nomad Scythians, but also the whole of Persia and all the barbarians who dwell in Egypt or, or Libya and worship Muhammad in their extraordinary ways. So he had a missionary spirit and, and wanted to see the surrounding non-Christian king kingdoms convert to the true faith. So that was good. Um, of course, it talks about the, uh, the Crusades uh, for, from a Greek perspective because they called the Crusades and they passed through the territory. And it talks a lot about Bohemian of Toronto, the son of Robert Giscard, who uh, Alexius had gone to war with back in the day uh, against the Normans. He was the son and the successor of Robert Giscard. Um, and then after, of course, uh, Bohemian ends up taking Antioch and creating the Principality of Antioch. And eventually, a few years later, he goes to war with the Byzantine Empire. And he makes him... And he loses. Uh, it's a pretty impressive battle where he loses. And um, uh, he has to sign a treaty where he becomes a vassal state of the Byzantine Empire. And the treaty is complete. It's transcribed in here. And it is a humiliating treaty. Uh, it's, it's an ugly one. And Bohemond has to sign it. Unfortunately for um, for Alexius and the Byzantine Empire, the terms of the um, of vassalage uh, dissolved um, uh, on the death of Bohemian, and he died not long after that. I think it was l l less than a year. Um, yeah, no, so th that's quite good. Now, should you read this book? Um, me, I'm trying to get people more interested in medieval history, specifically medieval church history. Um, and of course, this is a good, solid medieval church history book. And like, it's quite long, like, like it's almost 500 pages, which is quite a bit for uh, um, a, uh, a medieval biography of one person. So I'm trying to get more people interested in medieval history but th this text you probably don't want to start here if you have not read any primary sources of m medieval history you probably don't want to start here i'm going to do a video uh talking about all my favorite m medieval and patristic the early church church history uh uh documents and how to study and where to start um you you don't want to start here but if you got a firm grounding in uh medieval history and the byzantine empire uh you probably want to uh go here because it's a very important and it's a great read i love the writing style so it's it's yeah it's uh it's a good book i think you should read it but again get submerged in medieval history first i'm uh currently reading this book the island by adrian mckinty i've read another book of his i firmly re recommend i tell this to my fellow apologists to try to read fiction books too now some do i'm not going to name names of who does and who doesn't but some don't and throwing in a novel every now and then keeps me insane um uh I, I try to read every fifth book a novel. Like like every fifth book I read is a novel. Um, so as soon as I'm done this, I'm back to more medieval stuff. So yeah, that's uh, so that's my book review of the Alexiad by Anna Comnina. I hope you enjoyed this, and uh, let's hope that uh, a lot of pro-life candidates get elected in America uh, today. I'm not American, so I'm not voting in that election. So, But hopefully the ones who do think of life when they vote for their, their politicians, because there's a lot on the line in terms of the pro-life movement. 
So God bless you all. And I'm ending the stream now.